guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. It's going to be another hot day, hot week actually. It looks like we're still going to be above 100, 106 today, but something about living in the high desert, which is quite nice, is that um, even though we get so hot during the day, we usually dip like 40 or more degrees every night. So while it might be 106 tonight, like it'll be low 70s tonight. And so the morning is is quite nice. Like it takes quite a long time during the day to get all the way up to 106. So anyway, if there's a positive about living in a high desert where it is 106 degrees, that would be it. Anyway, let's just jump into the videos from last week of which we only have five because we did skip posting a video the day after the 4th of July. And like I said last week, there may be a day or two here or there that we might skip posting and I'll let you guys know in the community tab if we decide to do that just based on heat and um, projects and things like that. There are some days where it is a little bit of a struggle, not gonna lie, to get out there and like have the motivation to want to keep pushing forward in the heat. But so far we've done pretty good. Okay, first video was I've struggled with certain types of hydrangeas, so I'm trying again in containers. So hydrangea macrophyllas and serratas, which are the big leaf type and mountain leaf, mountain, mountain leaf, mountain type of hydrangeas, really historically have not done very well for me in the soil. I don't know if it's our soil type mixed with the extremity of our seasons, um, that sort of thing that I just, I love them though. I love them so much that I want to keep trying to grow them. And there are certain things that I will like try to push the boundaries, like citrus trees, for example, they are not a native here. They cannot survive our winter. Yet I would like my own homegrown limes. Like <sighs> gin and tonics are my drink and limes are what you use in that. And there is nothing like a fresh lime off of a tree. Remember, I make Aaron smell every single one <laughs> that yeah. I bring in. I like just roll it in my hand and I'll just have him smell. You don't even have to roll it. I mean, it's just like the room. You just, you just pull it and it smells. Yeah, there's just nothing like it. So like the oils are concentrated somehow. Oh, I don't know, they're amazing. Anyway, all that said, I had some gorgeous containers and some gorgeous macrophyllas and one type of serrata hydrangea and I potted them. Sarah said, morning, totally distracted by the cats playing in the background this morning. <laughs> and that was like overwhelmingly the most popular comment because Ch uh, Cheddar and Russell, which you kept your cool, Aaron never said anything like you can see what's going on. I had absolutely no idea they were even around me. Um, yeah, and I guess they were kind of romping around. I think Cheddar cleaned himself for a little while. <laughs> Cheddar's the worst about that. It's like he knows when there's a camera and he comes and is like, oh, it's bath time. <laughs> My time to shine. Uh, Whimsicle said, where to buy those pots, please? Um, I probably should have mentioned in the video, all three of those came from Unique Stone. Most of the time, if I'm using any concrete piece, it will have come from Unique Stone or Henry Studio. Um, that's where I've got like overwhelmingly the most amount of our concrete from. I don't know if that sentence made solid sense, but you get it. Uh, Julie's Garden Time says, are you going to let them stay in the pots in that location for the winter? I have some too and not sure if I should plant them or keep them in the containers. Uh, it depends on your, in, like your climate and your environment and if they like it typically in the area where you're at in the ground. Um, I will keep mine in containers because I know that they don't do well in the ground, that this is how I'm trying to tackle growing them. So I will leave them in those containers as long as they're happy. Uh, so for winter time, I will put them in our cold frame. Um, you could put them somewhere. We won't somewhere. have a cold frame. We won't have a cold frame. That's right. Yeah. It'll be a like full fledged greenhouse. Yeah. I forgot about that. We what need to build a cold, cold frame. Stuff? Well, you know what we could do is we could um, we could put walls on the, on high, the tunnels high tunnels and, and make those be cold frames. I think we're going to have to do that. Yeah. That'd be probably the best idea. So basically, I'll just keep them somewhere that's not heated, um, but that takes the edge off our cold and that way they winter over a little bit better. Typically when you're overwintering a shrub or a perennial in the container, you want to plant things that are rated two zones lower than your current growing zone, which we are a zone six. So that means I would want to pick things that are a zone four just to give yourself that buffer because they don't have insulation from soil all the way around their, you know, root ball. I mean, they have like a little bit um, compared to the ones that are in the ground. So they just tend to, it opens them up to a little bit more sensitivity to cold um, because of that. So putting them somewhere like an unheated shed or garage or something like that, they don't need light because they're not photosynthesizing in the winter. Um, they're dormant. So anywhere you can put them that just takes the edge off is a good idea. The one thing about that is you do want to make sure you keep them watered. Um, not like sop and wet and not bone dry. You just want a tiny bit of moisture in there to keep the roots healthy and happy. Um, because roots are still kind of active during the winter. They're still kind of slowly chugging away. Um, and if you dry them completely out because you put them somewhere where they can't receive any 
any natural rainfall or snow, that can be a problem. So keep that in mind. We've done videos about overwintering plants in containers. Maybe we can link one. Yeah. I think I went into more detail on other options that you can do if you don't have an unheated area to put your stuff. Lake Local said, what's your opinion on leaving out terracotta pots in the winter? Um, and in that same video, I did talk about that. It's always risky. Terracotta is probably the most susceptible to breaking um, due to like freeze thaw kind of things. However, like we used to be technically a zone five. Uh, we were just this year. Was it this year or last year where we were moved to a six? It's based on the 10 year average of temperatures. I'm not sure. No. Eh. Anyway, um, I've had terracotta pots out for probably the entire time I've gardened in my own garden, which is as long as we've been married, which is 15, almost, is it, is this year 15 or is it 16 this year? This year's 15. Is this year 15? Yeah. So 15 years. And I've only had one terracotta pot um, break in that amount of time. Uh, so I think that's pretty good. I do it even though it's risky. Jamie says, are there any hydrangeas that can take three hours of sun? I'm struggling here in Missouri, or do you think they all need shade? No, they do not need shade. I mean, the macrophyllas and serratus that I planted today need protection in the afternoon uh, in harsher climates like we have here, but they still need a block of sunlight in order to perform. So they need minimum of four to six hours of sun a day. So I'm just making sure that mine get that sun in the morning. So all the hydrangeas should be able to handle uh, a sunnier spot, but uh, I don't think shade, like a full shade situation is not really gonna work. However, you know, Erin, uh, my parents have that hedge of hydrangeas, they're Annabelle's, um, next to the pool, mm -hmm. underneath crab apple trees. And yeah. they're pretty much shade all day. Right. And they bloom every single year. There's but exception. Not, but they're pretty sparse. Oh, I think they're so pretty right there. Even though they don't bloom maybe like they would in a full sun situation, they never suffer for water. They're never wilty. They provide some bloom structure, which in a shady environment, it's a little bit tougher to do. I feel like they're really pretty there. Anyway, there's exceptions to every single rule in the garden. Every single one. <laughs> Julie says, what is the difference in keeling and iron and iron tone? Well, Erin, you could probably speak to this more than I can. I mean, basically what I know is a chelated iron is a synthetic form of iron that's readily, like quickly available to your plants. You can give it as both a foliar application, which is kind of a quick shot. The leaves absorb it, doesn't stick around for a long time. And then you can give it as a soil drench, which works more at a soil level. But then the iron, iron tone is an organic, slow release approach. Um, we're kind of doing all of it. Yeah, so. you pretty much nailed it. I think um, what I'm trying to do is do the chelated iron to correct it immediately. Because if you don't correct it immediately, the plants are not photosynthesizing. Mm -hmm. And they're essentially kind of just dying, like mm -hmm. withering and dying. So I'm doing the chelated iron to correct it immediately. And I'm also doing iron tone to try to correct it more long term. But even the iron tone, I think I'm gonna still have to keep up with that too. I don't think that I'll ever just, you know, be done mm -hmm. because we keep putting alkaline water back yeah. on the soil. So right. unless we could correct it at that point, or um, not correct it, but like put in um, some type of a, what do you call that? A, injector system. An injector system uh -huh. where I don't even know what you would put in. Maybe chelated iron, Maybe, you know, that'd be interesting. Just Oh boy, that would be expensive. Could you do that? Just put it on everything? <sighs> well, I'm, I guess you could do anything. Buy it in anything. Bulk. Chelated iron? Yeah, just put like a small amount of chelated iron in with your water. Would so that, that stain everything... things? I guess. Yeah, it probably would. Over it would time, it would stain red. things. Yeah, that's something to consider. Um, and in fact, we watered that that pot with the hydrangea with the chelated iron and it was dripping out like kind of reddish mm. which i don't really care because we're going to be replacing all that concrete underneath sure. that area where i set them but do keep that in mind like if you're setting them somewhere where it could possibly stain the concrete it will do that so you want a saucer underneath it mm. i'm just like ah, let it stain it's totally fine <laughs> you can just um, like add into the uh, pink concrete that's already over there. Alicia said, how often do they need to be watered? I'm in a zone nine. So that will absolutely depend on what size of pot you put them in, what kind of soil, how exposed they are to both sun and wind. Mine, I um, have already noticed, I mean, we're super hot right now. So we're having to give ours water every day. Um, and it doesn't take an enormous amount in the pot. You just water it like any other normal pot that you have out there with annuals. But um, especially when they're in bloom, in order for that plant to support those blooms and not start to wilt and have the blooms start to brown, you do need to water them consistently. 
Demi said, Russell and Cheddar photobombing is great, but what about drip to these beauties? So we talked about drip before we I planted them, um, and I knew I was gonna put them on a solid surface, and I didn't really have the proper feet that I wanted the pots to go up on. And then some of the holes are pretty small, the drainage holes, and I don't think it was enough to accommodate for the quarter inch drip, plus enough for water drainage and drainage is essential to keep these happy. So I would need to go get a more wide um, drill bit. What kind of, of drill bit do we have that's long and skinny? Is it like carb? Yeah, it's a carbide Carbide. Um, I need a thicker one because especially with like the urn, your drain hole is a lot longer. Like the other pots would be no problem because you know, they're just the thickness of whatever the concrete is. But when you're dealing with an urn that has, you know, you're planting bottom of your planting reservoirs here and the bottom of the pots here, like you have a very long drainage hole and you can't, if the pot's as tall, you can't reach the drill down from the top. You have to flip it over and then do the whole thing from the bottom. So I need one that's long and that's a little bit wider so that I can make the holes a little bit bigger. Um, in which case I think it would be better for the drip tubing. Now I can go right up the back side of the containers, which I've considered doing. I could just pop into that flower bed air and right, right behind. Right. I should probably do that. And then we won't have to even worry about bringing a hose around. So anyway, we'll probably get it set up one of these days. Steven said containers, hydrangeas, where? Sorry, I was watching the cats. Actually, those containers are so simple and so fully gorgeous. Um, while that big one is new, I have one that looks almost identical. I would li literally have to put them side by side to tell the difference. And I just kind of want to talk about that because that's very true. A lot of the times you look at a brand new variety of something and you're like, wow, it's so close to the old one. But I think where the difference comes in is in growth, it comes in over time. Um, growth habit, you'll probably have like, it may be a few degrees better in like keeping itself tidy and more uh, like full of leaves and more dense. Um, it might be that it pushes out more blooms, like you, the blooms could look very sim similar, but one will be more floriferous than the other one, or maybe they bloom a little bit longer, or maybe their winter hardiness has been upped a little bit. Um, so sometimes the changes can be somewhat minor, but they'll make a huge difference to the overall performance of the plants throughout the years. Yeah. Anything you want to add to that? Well, and sometimes it, it's regional. I mean, you kind of touched on that, but like, um, as an example, uh, you know, Proven Winners was so proud of their Amazel Basil. Uh -huh. Like, you know, to us, so they had fixed like a downy mildew issue mm -hmm. with a lot of basil. Mm -hmm. Well, so to us, we don't get, we're so dry that we don't have mildew issues right. with basil. Mm -hmm. So to us, it was kind of like, well, I mean, it's a great basil. There's nothing wrong with it. There's a lot of benefits to it. Mm -hmm. But it's like one shining key feature that everybody else was so excited about didn't apply to us. And that can happen. I yeah, think with a lot of different right. plants. That well, it's like, like, well, like flocks, you know, the new varieties of flocks, like the luminary backlight, uh -huh. um, is much more disease resistant than like David, you know, it's an old variety. But we don't deal with powdery mildew really on those because we're so dry. So yeah. it's like, well, you know, they're both awesome plants. Um, but I can see, like, if there were plants that were spider mite resistant, yeah. somebody needs to create a line of spider or mite resistant boxwoods. A super tunia that doesn't get budworms. Yes. Like super t uh, budworm resistant super tunias, that'd be awesome. Yeah, let's make the uh, purple fountain grass perennial while we're yeah. at it. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, can you imagine? Yeah, that would be awesome. There's so many different ways we can improve plants if we just yeah. knew, knew more things. But you know, it's right, if you if you just take like a random area and compare it with another plant, it's like, well, it, for you, it is the same plant, mm -hmm. but for someone else, it's improved. However, Amazel Basil has two really good developments. One, the downy mildew resistant, but also after it blooms, or it takes a lot longer for it to bloom. It doesn't bolt quite as quickly, but when it starts to bloom, it doesn't change the flavor of the basil. And that was another huge breakthrough because, um, you know, traditional varieties, I always grew Genovese basil. I, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but I always grew that one. It's a great basil but when it starts to bloom it takes on a little bit more of a different flavor um, and amazel doesn't seem to do that so I think that's a really good feature okay next video is fiddle leaf fig cutting update plus potting up new citrus papaya I never planted a papaya I planted a guava that was my fault I texted you the title uh -huh. why did I say papaya I don't know I need to fix that. I still haven't even fixed it. People are like, well, still waiting for the papaya repot <laughs> <laughs> and then the hardy fig. So I wanted to give you an update on the fiddle leaf fig cuttings that I took a couple of months ago, which are doing great. I mean, they had produced roots. They had actually produced new leaves. I wanted to get them repotted and just show you where I was at in the process. And then I picked up three small um, edible plants. So the kumquat, the navel orange, and the 
guava, pink guava, at my parents' garden center earlier on this season before, did they have leaves? I think those had leaves when I picked them up. And then the big hearty fig did not have leaves when I picked it up. I just saw it. They got two, I think, in, and I'm like, I better get it today, otherwise it's gonna sell and it won't be here. So I've been hanging on to it since early, early spring, just waiting for a chance to repot it. So anyway, we just kind of went through some of those, even though I've not grown any of those citrus or the figs uh, or the guava before, I just wanted to show you kind of like a before shot. Like this is how I'm kind of launching myself into this experiment and we'll see how it goes together. Uh, Darcy said, I'm voting Hartley instead of Glass Greenhouse too. It helps me dream of someday winning the lottery and owning my own Hartley. Yeah, we had a few. It wasn't just one comment of people saying, you know, when are you going to stop referring to it as a Hartley? It's a Glass Greenhouse. Um, and so, I don't know. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call it the Hartley because that's what it is. Yeah. That's what it is to me. Um, anyway, Audrey's comment, you don't call a Twinkie a sponge cake with filling. <laughs> <laughs> Therefore, it has to be the Hartley, not the glass greenhouse. Excellent, yeah. excellent point. And that's the thing. Like, we did some research on different greenhouses, and nothing was a Hartley. It's true. Like every, There's some other really nice ones out that there. That look similar, mm -hmm. too. But you look at, then at the quality or just the craftsmanship or something. Something about it is different. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I don't know because yeah, like I haven't experienced. Yeah, we don't want to knock anybody else's no. you know, greenhouses. I but. would be thankful for which, uh, you know, whichever one we were able to get. Um but there was just a different look and i don't know if it was partly nostalgia from standing in the one in england and i just had like this dream that started right there and i don't know and reading the english garden forever the magazine the english garden i love um they always advertise in that in that magazine mm -hmm. and so i just always have drooled over those pictures and so it could be partially that too anyway uh vix2705 said did she realize that she said fiddlehead fig twice no i didn't <laughs> until i uh, read your comment and then i watched it back i'm like oh i didn't even notice it when i rewatched the video or like before we posted it which i typically watch the video once through just to make sure i didn't say anything stupid which i <laughs> didn't catch that that one uh, katie said pink guava is one of my favorite fruits where did you get the plant so my parents got in this line it was kind of like um I don't know, you purchased the whole palette, I guess. It was like the, the shelving unit and then all of these different like fun types of edible plants. And they were all in uh, colorful metal containers. So it was a very striking display. And then each one of them had, you know, the picture that I showed you um, kind of stuck in the pot so you could see what these plants would produce. Brilliant marketing, honestly, because it got me. I actually um, bought a passion vine two this last week it's still sitting in its tin now in the greenhouse next to the ones i've repotted i just need to add that one in um so that was part of the same lot joyce said with all the heat that you've been getting and looking into next year is there anything you can add to the hartley for next year to protect the plants like inside shades yes so um, there were a ton of different accessories you could purchase with your hartley and we did get all the shades mm -hmm. Um, so I'm hope that will help. We are also going to be planting trees. Um, we will be planting trees that will shade it at least from the west, from that hot afternoon sun. We're not going to be using this greenhouse as a production greenhouse, like starting all my seeds in there and all that sort of thing. It's more going to be an extension of our home. So if it can catch some like morning sun and heat up a little bit, and then um, and get the bright light, then we're going to plant some things and then kind of strategically prune them to where there'll still be sunshine coming into the greenhouse, but it won't be like 150 degree, you know? Right. I don't know how much it would heat up. A glass house, our heat here. That's hard to say. Yeah. I Especially if you didn't have any shades, like no shades, no trees, nothing. I wonder how hot it would get in there. We'll have vents, we'll have fans. We'll we'll also, have... We're also installing a heating and air conditioning in that building so but i don't want to have to that's the other consideration like how much would it cost to keep this cool if we didn't have any help in terms of shades yeah. or we trees? won't keep it cool all the time we'll just keep it cool if we want to be in there and we won't keep it like inside the house sort of cool it'll be just like take the edge off the yeah. intensity sort of cool and heat we won't heat it to like a 70 degrees in the winter time mm -hmm. no way uh, Jean said, so much fun. How do you control the temperature in the cold frame? Well, the cold frame right now, we are temperature controlled by, um, we have the sides like maybe three feet up, the plastic's rolled up. So there's air getting, you know, through each one of the long sides. And then the big doors on either end are open. And then we have two fans setting, um, sitting right inside each one of the doors and they kind of help push air back and forth. It honestly, like it gets hot in there during the day, but not like 
unbearably hot. In fact, I spent, was it a week ago or a week and a half ago, I spent like four hours in there just kind of grooming and organizing and things like it was, it was lovely. And I was hot and I was sweating, but it wasn't like horrible. But that greenhouse, we're gonna be double layering this fall and we're going to treat that as a heated greenhouse from this point on, so. I'm looking forward to that. Sandra said, what will you use as a saucer on the fiddle leaf once you bring it in the house? Attractive square saucers are always a challenge. Yes, you need a pretty saucer for a pretty pot. I agree heartily. I, you know, I probably won't find one. Well, I, let me not say I probably won't find one. I think that down at the garden center, they have a line of gray terracotta, which I will have to seal if I put inside. So I can just do a seal layer on the inside. I can't remember which one was the best, Aaron, Rust-Oleum sealer or that Flex Seal in the well, can. Oh, we have to go back to the like video. Like as seen on TV. Yeah. The one I have the most confidence in is this one right here, which is the Rust-Oleum. It looks identical to our pre-glazed saucer. Um, I've got some of each one of those left, so I just would need to paint a seal layer because if it's a terracotta saucer, water will still seep through and it will wreck whatever surface it's sitting on. Um, so I think they'll have a gray one, which I think will blend in. It won't match the pot exactly, but it's better than plastic. And there are a lot of cases where I have to just go ahead and use plastic and it's just the way it is because I wish pots, I wish every single decorative pot would come with a matching saucer. I don't know why that's not a thing. I don't know if it's because they're hard to manufacture or what not. Easier than a pot, don't you think? If you had to make a pot or a saucer, which one do you think would be easier to make? A saucer? Yeah, just really, <laughs> I don't know. I would think that it would be easier, but I don't know about how they do that. Uh, Nikki said, love it when you do projects in the cold frame. What is the galvanized tub behind you? So I had potatoes in there, which I harvested recently. I planted them in the, I don't know, I think it was right after Samantha was born. I found my basket of pierced potatoes from last year's harvest that I meant to use first and then I forgot the basket was downstairs. So I had this basket of like all gnarled up looking nasty, you know, punctured potatoes, but they were starting to sprout and I thought, you know what? I'm not gonna eat these, they're too gross, but maybe if I plant them, we can get some more out of them. And sure enough, um, pot, uh, popped them in that galvanized tub, which was not being used for anything at the moment, and grew at least, I think we've had four dinners from what I got um, out of there. So that's worth it to me. So what I have in there now, I started a bunch of dahlias from seed this last year. Dahlia plants are extremely susceptible to spider mites, especially when they're in close quarters with everything else. Every single one of them got spider mites, and I sprayed them, and then, um, they kind of were like just still sitting there with a little bit of spider mite damage and I didn't want to subject all of my other dahlias that I grew from tubers. All of those are clean plants with no insect issues at the moment, knock on, knock on wood. Um, but I didn't want to plant mine out there and possibly infect the rest of them. So I just cut all of the foliage off, which these plants were pretty good size. I cut them all off and uh, knocked the soil off. It was crazy i have some pictures but they form little tubers just in like three no it's probably three months in the soil three months time from a dahlia seed they form these little tuber clumps so i just cleaned every single one of those up and then i planted them in that tub and they're starting to come up so we may have just kind of a late crop of dahlias from that and they're just a huge tub full of them it's so exciting ja said did i miss the part where she planted the papaya i'm guessing she meant guava yes i will fix that after we are done with this video Stephanie said, have you thought about how you will decorate the greenhouse for Christmas? Will you put lights on it? It will be super fun if you set up a tree with the gardening themed ornaments you have inside. Now, I don't think we're gonna be putting Christmas lights on the exterior of the Hartley. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want any sort of, I don't know how you would attach it to the greenhouse. And plus, I think if we have a Christmas tree in there, that'll be the perfect yeah, amount of sure. illumination. Um, and I think we're gonna figure out some kind of up lighting gonna shine some light at that beast during the the night so that you can really see its beauty in the garden I'm so excited plus I did buy a chandelier the last time my mom and I went uh, antiquing I found a chandelier for it so we'll have that hanging in the center and I, I'm hoping I can get that on a dimmer um, so that I can kind of have it just a very low light in there oh I think it's gonna be so pretty I cannot wait they are putting the brick on today or starting the brick uh, today it's so exciting uh, how many days till installation what day is today? I think it's just a week. July 12th, yeah, one week from today. Uh, Jay said, how can we tell which plants are legal to propagate and which aren't? So that's kind of a weird, hard subject to talk about because I mean, technically most plants 
especially if they, if they have a brand, they're illegal, illegal to propagate, but it's usually on a more commercial level. Like growers can't just take any old plant and make cuttings and propagate and then sell them. If you're doing your stuff at home, like... No one's coming after you. No, if somebody owns the genetics to a specific type of dahlia, let's say, and you plant the tubers, well, one tuber turns into 10 tubers in one year. So you've essentially propagated that, that dahlia tuber. Now, if you were to go into business, you would probably need to look at licensing and like paying the fees so that you are licensed to sell that specific variety of tuber. Um, but if you're just growing your own crop, like tuber police isn't gonna come to your door and, and track you down, you know? Like uh, I was talking to um, Proven Winners and they have a new James Pretenia coming out, which these plant, no, is it that one? I think it was that one, that they've been trialing for like 30 years. Mm -hmm and 30 years worth of trialing and breeding, and they finally have one that's worth it. Like, that's better than all the rest of them that's gonna be coming out, Safari Dawn and Safari Sky. Um, Safari Dawn's doing great in our mixed arrangements so far. It's beautiful sunset colors. Um, anyway, like, I learned that this plant, they've been just, you know, trying. Well, it takes a long time when you yeah. try something new. Sometimes or, it takes an entire season to find out if whatever you did was in successful. in the shrub division, it could take 10 years to yeah. see how something's going to do. Right. Or like evergreens. That's why specimen evergreens are so much money. They're so expensive because it takes forever to see like, what size does this tree get in the mm -hmm. landscape? You know, what does it do? What does the growth habit look like? Well, people have years and years and decades dedicated to this one variety of plant and so much money goes into that. Yeah. I didn't even realize, mm -hmm. you know, you just don't think about that sort of thing. But like on a home scale, I wouldn't like worry too much about it. I mean, we propagate succulents on occasion and we, you know, expand our dahlia. I mean, if you want to get into business, dahlias are the way to go, man. Yeah. Dahlias are expensive and they are so easy to grow and they're so easy to multiply. Like, I feel like I could have gone into business after this last year. Yeah. Jeez, the Louise. Oh. <sighs> So many Dahlia tubers. Okay, next video was 15 perennials that love the heat. So I took time out of garden projects outside when it was hot and just decided to talk about plants that are doing great in the heat right now. What plants can really handle um, and really thrive and look pretty during this time of the year where a lot of things are just kind of like suffering and hanging on. Um, so 208 bon Bonstrom said, Laura says, I hope this is helpful after masterf masterfully sharing a wealth of knowledge and experience. Helpful is an understatement. How do we ever garden successfully without you? Thanks, GA team. Super encouraging. Thank you for that comment. Um, Ron Ronnell said, did you know that a swarm of ladybugs is called a loveliness? Really? Yes. <laughs> I think that is the sweetest thing. So I talked about uh, Purple Illusion Veronica. I went to go cut mine back one fall and I noticed just tons of ladybug larvae and adult ladybugs. No aphids or anything. The aphid source had to be somewhere nearby, but I didn't like investigate. But yeah, I did not know that a swarm was called a loveliness. And then it kind of, like, there was a thread after that. And so Allison said, did you know a group of crows is called a murder? <laughs> Really? Yeah. And then a flock of flamingos is called a flamboyance. Wow. Um, a group of hummingbirds is called a charm. I've never seen a group of hummingbirds. That would be a real, that would be a treat. Yeah, I've never seen more yeah. than like one at a time. Um, DLS says a group of giraffes is called a tower. A group of magpies, a twittering. A group of geese, a gaggle. A group of owls, a parliament. And a group of fro a green frogs is an army. An army of I frogs. Just, I I've enjoyed heard of that. that thread so much. Just I never knew. Yeah. I think I knew that a flock of flamingos was called a flamboyance. It comes um, up with these. And then a geese as a gaggle. But I think those are the only two that I actually had really like. I had heard. Anyway, uh, Maga Mama said, "Is there a way to get salvia to stop slumping and looking so tired? I wish it was a little stronger. I've been trying it, but it just slumps." Um, a couple of things that could be going wrong. One, it might not be getting enough sun. It might be getting too much water, possibly, or maybe not enough, something to look into. It may need to be divided if yours is really old, um, and it may just need a good cutback in the middle of the season. So I would check all those things, and then let me know <laughs> next year if you still have a salvia slumping problem. Going Green Mom said, if hibiscus grows in bogs, will they grow in partial shade? They need, they're a full sun plant, so they need six to eight hours minimum um, to be happy. So, I mean, technically, if you have half a day of shade and half a day of strong sun, they should still be all right. 
Cheryl said, could you cut back penstemon like you do salvia once it's done blooming? Will it rebloom then? No, typically they have a bloom season and it's fairly a, a long season and I just make sure usually to plant varieties of penstemon that have really beautiful blooms after, or seed heads after they're done blooming. Like the Midnight Masquerade is a favorite of mine and I leave the bloom stalks up because they turn into these little shiny uh, burgundy color, like kind of like a burgundy brown colored seed head that I like to use in flower arrangements and they stay up. They don't like flop over. Katie said, I saw parts of this video on TikTok yesterday. The user was garden answer. Is that really you guys? Yep. I'm not sure that I've ever been on TikTok. Aaron's been messed around. <laughs> have I been on TikTok before? Like have I ever even looked? That's pretty lame. Like I should probably not admit that. You know, um, I've been just at, uh, cutting up the, you know, other videos and uh -huh. posting them. But, but hold on, hold on just a second. I appreciate everybody saying, like when you see something like that, saying something to us, even if it is us, because there's so much scam activity going on these days that you never know. You're up to 3,571 followers. What? So That's pretty awesome. There you go. Leah said, I have a question. I have Midnight Masquerade in my garden. It's been there for about five years. The last few years, the blooms fall over and create a messy look. Is this normal? No, that is not normal. Um, so just like with the salvia, there are several things you can check. Um, it may be a case where you need to divide the plant, uh, just kind of recharge it a little bit. You may not be giving it enough light, or maybe like five years ago, it was getting more sun and something near it has grown a little bit bigger and it's casting more shade, that's possible. Um, soil could be doing it too. If you're fertilizing it too much, it can get a little bit like, like not happy. So I would check those things. Kayla said, also beautiful and thanks for sharing. Could you do a second half to the greenhouse video on these extra hot days? Yes. That's a we great should. idea. We yeah, totally we should. should. Like, but in the studio. Like it's now yeah. at this point of the video, it's starting to get a little bit uncomfortable yeah. in here. <laughs> uh, Frida said, first of all, I love your channel. Thank you. Had a baby this spring and been binge watching the latest seasons like crazy. With this heat going on, do you consider planning for more extreme weather in the future? Yeah, it's definitely on my mind for sure because you guys know we're in high desert here. Water is not really an issue. I mean, we have big reservoirs. Um, we haven't had any restrictions put on us and I don't know how full the reservoirs are, but it seems like our, our like throughout my life, there have been years where the reservoirs haven't been quite as full because we haven't had as much snowpack in the mountains. Um, and everything kind of like evens out over time. Uh, we also are very careful about how we water. I mean, you guys know we talk about our drip system all the time and we try as much as possible to install drip systems that are working efficiently and properly um, without wasting water. If you can water right at the root zone of the plant rather than overhead watering where you're losing a lot of water to evaporation, especially where it's so hot and you're losing a lot just to run off. It's like hitting parts of the ground that don't need it. Uh, I feel like drip systems are such a good way to be as efficient with water as possible. And it's something that I think about too going forward and planting this um, new area. We're just planting things that don't require. I mean, there may be a time where we put some hydrangeas out there or whatever, but it's not gonna be loaded up with plants that need a ton of extra attention in that way. Same with like needing attention for insects and things. I want this area to be a little more self-sustaining. In fact, I'm, I'm planning out some more dryland type meadow areas that I would like to plant and kind of cultivate some natives out there, like true natives to our area. Um, which it's just gonna be really fun. Next video was planting a shady border. So we have a flower bed along our back fence line that meets up with our neighbor's yard. And I've really not done much back there. I mean, it was just blank area. Um, we don't go back there though often. I mean, when I do go back there, I'm like, why haven't I planted anything back here? It's so bare. But then we just don't go back there. I, we need to create a reason. And I think that we're, we're thinking through some ideas. Erin, you were thinking maybe a rose garden at some point. Right. Um, which like that surprised me that you would even want that because you're always like kind of meh about roses because they, they do have a lot of downtime during the summer like right. they come out in beautiful bloom and then they lull and then they'll come back I think our biggest problem with that area is is trying to figure out because we have had in the past we've had talks with our neighbor about buying some land behind and so you know you think well if we had the land behind it what would we do yeah. and if we never got it what would we do you know if we never got it we would probably start right now planting evergreens yeah to block off the view just because you don't know what's going to happen you know like he could develop houses on it or you just don't know mm -hmm. and so you you would try to you do something. Your future. You'd, hedge you. in your, you'd yeah. do something different than if you knew that you were going to own it one day. So I think that's the the hardest part with that 
land, that plot of land back there. Because it would be wildly different depending on any one of those situations. Yeah. It is hard. So but, in, but again, remember what we talked about, was it last week we talked about like just charging ahead and yeah. just doing things for the now? Sometimes that... Like, that may pan out in the future. And if we do end up having the opportunity to buy it, we just have to remove a few things in order to make a through. Yeah. Right? Like, it doesn't like necessarily... to get back there. Yeah, it doesn't necessarily mean that we'd want to tear everything out that we put in there. Maybe. I don't know. It's the name of the game, though, with what we do. It's kind of like, let's just develop areas, and if we need to change it, we change it. It's part of our job. It's not like... Yeah. I don't know. And I don't get super emotionally attached to plants because it has been my job and working in a garden center too you realize that things are grown as crops kind of yeah, like our you know calloused. corn is a crop bean is a crop we rip them out at the end of the season and that's that it's kind of like annuals i know there are a lot of people who suffer when you have to pull those annuals i don't i'm like oh get out yeah. get out <laughs> i'm done dealing with you i'm ready for something fresh and just knowing that it's just the it's a circle of life right in the garden anyway that's probably a bad attitude to have but maybe good in our situation with what we do. Yeah. You know. Okay. First comment was from Jane. Cheddar is the best. Um, am I the only one that thought in the jungle, the mighty jungle, as he walks through the plants? Yeah, he was cruising through the back of that gator, like trampling. I could hear the leaves kind of snapping. Yeah. <laughs> He's an affectionate cat. He wants to be, like, right there. Um, Megan said, if you take the willow out, knocking the tree down, would it spread spider mites to the tree next to it, the grass, the other flowers? Probably. Probably it would be a good idea to take it down when it's dormant, like when the spider mites are, like the activity is done for the season. Sure. Yeah. Um, that'd probably be the best time to take it down. I don't want to take that tree out. I like Scarlet Curls Willows, but that one's kind of beyond. It just di like dies. Big sections of it die every single year, and it's just so fraught with problems that I'm just kind of... Yeah, we need to get something in there, too, that's evergreen because, um, you know, there are some things like uh, there's our stuff behind the barn. There's also our neighbor store stuff back there, too. And in the wintertime, when there's no trees, trees, when there's no leaves on that tree, you'll still be able to look through the Hartley and see back behind the barn a little bit. So it'd be really nice to have, like, some big evergreens back there that just provided a year-round block. Tina said, did you see Klaus Dalby prune prunes his elderberry into tree form. Gorgeous. As a shrub, it looks overwhelming. They are kind of overwhelming as a shrub, but can be beautiful. Um, our neighbor prunes them up in tree form too. And every year I'm like, oh. <laughs> last year they were so big and glorious. Um, and then I saw that they pruned them up into that kind of more vase tree form, but they're just as beautiful this year. That's something we might consider, Erin, for the instant karmas. Mm -hmm. We have some instant karma elderberries, especially the one right by our vegetable garden. Like, it looks kind of like a rack right there. It is so big and it, so... It just needs more space. It would be better as more of like a specimen plant in, in, if, if in out in the... In the new... We should but plant a couple But if we prune it, there. though, strategically like that and kind of prune it into more yeah, of a we tree, should, I think it'd be we really We either pretty. need to move it or prune it. Yeah. One of the two. Yeah. Love Gardening said, you always make drip irrigation look so easy. Can you please tell me which products you use? I have such a hard time getting my fittings to enter it. I've tried purchasing the tool that helps you push the tubes and fittings in, but I'm still struggling. I've been ordering from Amazon and just have not been uh, having luck. We get the majority of our drip things from Home Depot. Right. I order I order online. Um, like, I, I put in a, a pretty good-sized order this spring. To Home Depot directly. To Home Depot, yeah. And just had it had it shipped here. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. I, so, it's like Dig Corp is the brand that Home mm -hmm. Depot uses. A lot of it is pretty interchangeable, though. Like, if you, we've got another place locally called Pipe Co. Um, and they see, they're like more of a place that serves uh, landscapers. Landscapers, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so we've used some of their stuff, too, and it's all pretty interchangeable. So I don't know. We have our favorites, though. Like, you, we don't buy by the half inch black poly that's in the irrigation section at the Dig Corp. Right, the Dig Corp brand. Really, we buy it's a just the Dig Corp brand. Like anything else works. It's like I just don't like the Dig Corp of the brand black of yeah. Poly. So, but we get Dig Corp of the brown poly with the emitters yeah. every eighteen inches. And I'm gonna stop buying the eighteen inches. I'm gonna do nine or twelve. Oh really? Yeah. The eighteen. I don't think the eighteen is good. I think I think twelve is better for spacing. Then we can run the drip less time yeah. too. That's a good idea. Well, oh, we have. Can you the, imagine though? I guess we just start using it, and then eventually, as we replace drip throughout yeah. the garden. Paul has done so much work on our drip this year. 
Paul's been awesome. He yeah. just like gets it. He gets the drip and he gets my type A with the mulch too. He's like remulching things right now and it's looking so good. And he like there's not a speck of mulch on top of any plant. Like it's so perfection. Oh, he does a great job. Maybe one day he'll let us introduce him. I don't think he's super comfortable with cameras, so I respect that. But he's doing an amazing job. Like just know um, whenever we show stuff and if it's looking like really good, it's usually Paul. <laughs> he's done a really great job. Um, okay, Paula said, do you get box elder bugs on the box elder trees? We have them in Ontario, Canada in the area we live. They cluster in the hot sun, a real nuisance. Yes, box elder bugs are a nuisance. We do not get them because our box elder tree is called a sensation box elder. They're in the maple family. They're an Acer Nagundo. Um, there are female and male since, uh, box elders. The sensation is a male clone, so it does not produce seeds, um, which is what the box elder bugs are attracted to. So we do not have box elder bugs here. Um, if you have female Acer Nagundos, female box elder trees, you'll probably be dealing with those bugs. So that's kind of the difference there. My grandparents in Payette, which is just one town over, they always had those red, those box elder bugs. Mm. I don't know what kind of trees they had. They. I remember that. I remember from working at Cable One, um, there were some houses, they'd be covered yeah. in those things. However, we have elm seed beetles right now. It's the first year they've ever actually afflicted our house really badly, but they, they come and they feed on elm seed, those little round seeds that they produce, the little white discs. And um, we, have, we have trash elms here. Like if we could just get rid of every elm tree in this area, it would be fantastic. Then maybe we'd get we'd rid of- We'd have no shade though. There's so many junk trees our, around here. Our whole entire city is shaded by elm trees. And they're they're the worst trees. Like they just they all look kind of mangy, yeah. and they all have big dead spots in them because they're affected by borers as well. Right. And not you know nobody, not everybody is going to be treating their trees with a systemic insecticide to keep those out. And they're all oftentimes so old and so affected that it's not even worth it. Right. Anyway, I mean you guys know our plight with the elm trees. We had all of ours. There was three in our yard, and like they were one of them, just a big trunk just fell down. Just there was three in a grouping and I was watering right nearby it and one of them just, and it was not windy. It was like a day like this, super still. And I heard a giant crack and the huge, a third of the tree fell down like 30 feet from me. Like that is not safe. Right. I have kids and I don't want like trees like that. I don't know, I'm kind of getting off. Anyway, David said, why is this garden a separated space from the rest of the yard, fenced off from the formal garden space? Well, I think initially that that back garden was pasture and it was that way when the previous owners moved in. All the way back. Yeah. Yeah, there was no back fence. It was right. just one fence. One fence and then it was pasture because they owned they owned the piece of ground behind our barn that we would really like to buy one day. Uh, and they had sold it off to the neighbors and then they put up the back fence and so yeah that first fence was already there so you just do kind we of, know that's the way it was i think it's what the guessing. way it was i mean i'm not 100 percent sure we could ask dennis but i'm i'm pretty certain he said that was pasture because where those windows were there were stalls uh -huh. there were stalls to the barn right there anyway it'd be interesting i wish i wish that we would really i think dennis took a bunch of pictures we should see if we can get some copies yeah. it'd be interesting to see just the, the evolution of all these spaces but anyway yeah so it's just kind of this fenced off space which it's naturally separated from the rest of our garden by our driveway but we've talked about removing that fence and i think once the hartley's in we'll want to do that mm -hmm. and create something that's a little bit more open back there even though the driveway will still go through it mm -hmm. um i think that might be nice i've always wanted to get rid of that first fence you know that yeah i do know that yeah maybe your day is about ready to <laughs> to come <laughs> I'm, I'm okay getting rid of it too. It's just that I am not okay having every area of our garden torn up. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> well, this is the year. No, 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 no. It's just like, oh, we just need to button up some stuff. James said, have you ever thought of putting big rocks in big planting beds just to fill up space? Just a thought. No, I'm not a huge rock fan myself. A lot of people do rocks though. Yeah, and they look good in spaces. Um, I don't know. I'm, Especially commercial spaces. Yeah, well, it, it looks like it fits there. And we were starting rocks in your um, brother's garden mm -hmm. there for a while before he sold his house. And it was it actually looks really pretty. Like the plants have grown up beautifully. Um, we've thought about putting some rocks out along our lane because when people come down our lane and realize it's a dead end and that it's a residential place, they turn around, but in our grass. Yeah, what's up with that? I don't know what is up with people thinking that they can do that. 
I'm like, we like, have a huge sign on. that says private property yeah, at the beginning. Yeah, and then to drive on the grass, yeah. too. And I wouldn't even mind if, you know, driving on the grass is like, whatever. But it's when, like, it's right after it's been watered or whatever, and yeah. they leave ruts. Yeah. And then they don't say anything. They don't come knock on the door and be like, hey, I'm so sorry I left ruts in your grass. They just drive off. Yeah. I can't even imagine causing any type of damage to someone's property mm -hmm. and not letting them know that it was me. Right. And, like, saying, what can I do to fix it? So we've considered putting some rocks strategically along the lane just to um, eliminate some of that monkey business. I want but like spike strips or something. That's a, that's a little intense. <laughs> <laughs> Not a bad idea. <laughs> okay, last question on that is how wide are those beds? Can you let me know? I think they're about four to five feet deep. Would you recommend four that feet. size though? No, you six wouldn't. foot minimum yeah, flower beds. You wouldn't do that no, if I wouldn't you do that. were planning it new. Mm -mm. Um, last video from this week was another one of our kind of uh, maintenance montage videos where I just did a bunch of work and then I talked over it. Okay, so I feel like, based on reading the comments, after the first week, 95% of you really liked the new format. Same with this week. It seemed like a lot of you guys, one, understood why we were doing it because it's just so hot and it's a good way to get a lot of things done. But it's just kind of a fun change of pace and I kind of got from the comments the feeling like, that you guys liked it. So we'll probably keep doing that for a little while at least, um, once a week maintenance, because uh, it's just something we, we gotta do. So in that one, uh, I started off in the vegetable garden, harvested cabbages, found a nest of quail eggs that made me feel horrible. Um, and then what else did I do? I, I redid the drip in those beds, replanted those beds, harvested onions, trimmed the basil, thinned the corn, and then we went and trimmed the weeping willow, and then I went and cleaned the fountain. So I was really happy with everything that got done. Sandy said, I really, really like this format. It's so seamless and free flowing. I'm so pleased you're going to continue doing some videos like this. Take care. Super happy to hear that because honestly, when it's hot and I'm sweaty and I just need to get stuff done, it's way easier for me. And it's so nice too, Erin, to have you out there because oftentimes when I'm vlogging projects like that, I'm moving the camera around by myself and like halfway wondering, am I getting the shot right? Am yeah. I making it interesting? And there's, so there's so much more that goes into it when I'm by myself in right. terms of what I have to think about. When you're out there, I'm like, oh, I just get to kind of release and just do what I like to do, which is I like the grunt maintenance of gardening for the most part, even in the heat. Mm -hmm. I mean, cause you can make things look so much better in a short amount of time. Yeah, you get the satisfaction. Yeah. Uh, PJ said, aren't you supposed to trim willow in the winter when the leaves are gone? Yeah, that's the best time to trim trees. You can trim strategically throughout the season. The willows, they grow so fast and we get such high wind here that we have to keep the weight off the canopy. Otherwise, um, if I left a lot of it there, I think we'd have a lot of broken branches and I don't I don't want to lose my weeping willows. I love them. Uh, Country Girl 3 said, uh oh, looks like your kangaroo bag had a seam rip near the bottom. Do they have a warranty? Do they have a warranty on them? I want to say they do. They should never place a warranty on anything. We would never I'm take using. them up on it. No, we We're put too hard our on them. yeah. We put like way too much weight, and we use them. I'm gonna thoroughly use them every single day, and usually I have three. Um, we used all the ones we're using currently were used throughout last season too, which that's a really long time for us to get uh, kangaroo papa bag use. Usually we're replacing once a year. It's like a once a year uh, cost. Totally worth it. I love those bags so much. Uh, I have two more coming. I ordered two like two weeks ago. Do you know when they're supposed to get here? Today. Today. Yeah, I so said they're supposed to be delivered awesome. today. Yeah, because I have one of them um, has a metal. The metal rings completely out of the bag. It comes with a lifetime warranty. Oh. Wow. I don't know how in the world they could offer that. Uh, Nathan said, "Did you know weeping willows only live sixty to one hundred years?" Yes, a lot of plants have a life span on them a lot of them do and they'll just peter out after a certain amount of years um rob said what about using a small power washer to clean the fountain yeah that is a consideration we just bought a power washer i don't know how to operate it and i asked aaron about it at the beginning of this video actually paul was mentioning that he was maybe thinking about taking the power washer to it yeah. that'd probably be a really good thing to do that'd be really satisfying to watch maybe we'll film that because that fountain is looking pretty bad even after it's cleaned i'm like Ooh. <laughs> um donna said love this format love spotting the quail running around in the background that made me feel so i didn't even see so when i very first like started messing around in the cabbage you can see the female quail come out from under the cabbage i didn't see it and kind of walk toward the back of that bed i had no idea 
that they were under there. And the, the quandary was, well, like they can't move all these eggs, right? Like birds, once they've laid their egg, they can't like pick them up anyway and move no, them. No, they don't. Um, so all of a sudden they're exposed to our super hot temperatures. There's no protection in that area. They wouldn't sit on them right in the middle of nowhere with nothing around them right. for protection. I don't imagine they would anyway. And I can't touch them. because Killdeer do. Well, killdeer are a different animal. Yeah. They're like kind of prehistoric somehow. <laughs> like, I don't know. But um, once you touch them, they won't mess with them, right? It's like humans aren't supposed to handle them. I think so, yeah. I was worried about that and messing with them that way. But I knew um, our neighbor has a, a uh, incubator. So I text her. I'm like, is there any chance <laughs> you want 15 quail eggs? And she was like, absolutely. So she's got all like the quail fencing and anything. She said that they were going to let them hatch and then they were going to release them after they were a certain age, which is awesome. So um, I asked her if we could get some updates uh, along the way. Uh, Kathy said, quail eggs, how amazing to find those. Are you anywhere near the fires in your state? I don't think we're super close by, like kind of within hundreds of miles, like hundreds, right? But we're we get the smoke, which honestly, okay, so this is something I might regret hard here in a couple of weeks, but we've got pretty good smoke cover right now that's just acting as a cloud cover and so it's still hot but it is kind of taking the edge off the sun and i trimmed a bunch of our boxwoods yesterday i started with the ones in the shadier area by our back sun porch and i i didn't do a heavy trim i just i told aaron like they're so wild and mangy and I, it hasn't been bothering me too much but i just thought this might be a really fun opportunity to try something because if i don't take them down hard like into the growth like the thicker growth just take off like the really wild tops i'm only cutting off stuff that's already exposed it's already acclimated to the sun because sun and and air and stuff is already getting around this growth so what if i just trimmed off the edges just to tighten them up a tiny bit and then i got kind of carried away so I started on the ones that were in full shade, like the, the six spheres underneath our maple, and then the, the boxwoods that kind of go around the curve there. Some of you guys will know exactly what I'm talking about by our back sun porch. And then I looked at the ones that are like the little North Pole hedge around our hellebores by our gray table. I cut all those back, and then I did every single boxwood around our fireplace area, some of which actually get quite a bit of afternoon sun. However, if we have this cloud cover, I'm hoping that it they are okay. We might suffer from some a little bit of brown tips, they might look the worst ever, or we might have figured out a really good time of the year to trim boxwoods because it almost doesn't matter. Whenever I trim boxwoods, they always brown. Spring, early fall, uh, they always brown. Don't you think, Erin? Like we've never experienced a good boxwood trimming time here. Right. It's like, it, there's just not a really good ideal window because things change so quickly um, and we always have brown. And you know what, we've tried like the wilt stop, that's what's called we've tried spraying that on there it doesn't work that well to stop the browning right in extreme situations it works well to preserve evergreens in holiday projects that's the best use for that but i've been trying that wilt stop on like the serbian spruces i trimmed by the chicken coop on small sections of boxwoods i trimmed up in versailles and they're still getting brown so anyway i will let you guys know uh how that goes um uh, but yeah so july the 11th was the day i trimmed the boxwoods Aaron count like note it note <laughs> it down and we'll see what happens yeah. and that is it for today's recap video so yeah exciting stuff with the Hartley going on this week uh, we have been like we haven't shared a tremendous amount I mean a little snippets here and there and I'll share pictures and stuff along the way a little bit um, but we are getting footage of all of the stuff that's going down so hopefully in the end we'll be able to really kind of walk you guys through our process and what we thought about it and some of the um, the things we think about like some of the hard stuff that we didn't know we were gonna have to choose, right? you know, or the things we didn't even think about. Anyway, we'll be able to share our full experience um, once it's all up and going. It'll be a while though. Like I think it'll be a shell of a greenhouse for a while before we have electrical water um, and all of that. What's the other thing that we have to have run? Yeah, we have quite a bit of a journey left. We do, because we still like, we'll have to do all the flooring and all of that will be afterward because people have to be able to get in and dig and put lines in. Right. So I don't know like if we went about it the right, I mean, we went about it how we were supposed to, right? Oh. Well, I think we could do a little bit better if, um, well, not necessarily, because if you had made, I was just gonna say, if you had made some de some decisions faster, but if you had made some decisions faster, it might've gotten into, us into position, like we might've gotten into a corner mm -hmm. where like, it's, all, it's good that we don't have a flooring in right now because we're gonna have to dig a bunch of stuff out for right. the HVAC. Mm -hmm. So that was good. Right. See, so. that's when <laughs> putting off decisions. 
<laughs> Procrastinating pays. pays. <laughs> yes. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching this video. I hope you're having a great week so far and we will see you in the next one. Bye.